right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Pensive Politics with Mr. Watson. I'm your host, Christian Watson. And with me, I have, and please uh, tell me, how do I pronounce your name, sir? John? Well, we, we say Lefebvre. Lefebvre. Okay, Lefebvre. Okay. John Lefebvre. Now, John Lefebvre. Lefebvre. Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm going, it's actually Lefebvre. Lefebvre. Like, okay. The, the, yeah, the French might say it with a little bit more uh, pizzazz, a little more sauce on it. They might say something like Lefebvre or something oh, okay. like that. But John we just say Lefebvre. it like it's Lefebvre, Lefebvre like Lefebvre. Lefebvre. Okay, I got it. I, I'll yeah. work on it. Good. Uh, so I yeah, have no, Mr. no, we're good. We're good. We're good. I have Mr. Good. Lefebvre here, and he wrote a book that I find very interesting. And he'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. And, you know, I really had him on because I'm trying to expand – the category of guests I have on this show, because I talk about politics quite a lot, but you know, at the heart and core of my political commentary is ultimately philosophy. And I found his iteration of philosophy to be quite fascinating. And even if I don't entirely agree with everything, I think that the formulation of a lot of his ideas as it's applied to contemporary works is necessary and it's needed if we're gonna have a little bit of depth in our understanding. So Mr. Lefebvre, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us a little bit about the thesis of your book and the sort of framework by which you approach politics. Well, first of all, Christian, if, if I may, uh, John, I'm sure. Okay. John, no problem. All right. I'll be, I, I can be John today. Thanks. Um, I'm, uh, I've studied philosophy a bit myself in undergrad. I wound up uh, putting it to a, um, a particular use in that I ultimately studied law and practiced law for about 15 years or so. Uh, it never really um, soothed my soul much, Christian. It was a, you know, many of my friends had, you know, very rewarding practices in the practice of law, but I always found it to be a bit, um, uh, not, yeah, it's just, uh, it, it was a bit arm's length for me, maybe I should say. My, it, it wasn't my heart and soul. But I will say this of that practice of law, it's a, um, it's a tremendous education and I highly recommend it to anybody. And one of the reasons I think it is, is because, um, you know, you've, we've all heard the aphorism that, um, uh, you know, it's a poor lawyer who stops looking when he gets the answer that suits him. <laughs> and uh, because, and we all, I think, understand that the reason is because we all know that the lawyer on the other side is working really, really, really hard to find an answer that doesn't suit him. And so we need to know that too. So the long and the short of it is that the legal education, Christian, is one that requires us to think the way the other guy does. So in other words, it requires us to put ourselves in the other in the other person's position and see what it looks like from them. That's a beautiful lesson to learn for all for all all humanity. And so if if people went to law school for no other reason, that would be good enough. I studied, you know, I, I grew up a little bit before I went to university. I was 27 or 28 before I went to university. I, you know, I was a working guy, construction guy, taxi driver. I was out in the world when I was. Um, I was 17 in 1969, so um, I, I don't know what that means to you immediately, but to me what it means immediately is that we were in a crazy time, you know, uh, we uh, rock and roll had turned into, you know, the Who and Jethro Tull and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and I love you, I love you turned into, ooh, ooh, a storm is threatening, my very life today, that kind of thing, right? And so I was a kid in a very wonderful time and, um, you know, I'm going to jump to the present. I'm going to say, you know what? I, there is no reason why 2021 can't wind up making 1969 look like 1953. 2021 can be an extremely exciting year in, a, in our in our North America and our Western society. And so I'm I'm really very much looking for it. In any event, I practiced law for about 15 years, and then um, uh, I met I met somebody in the practice of law who was a very innovative entrepreneur and we came up with a business that was wildly successful. I don't know how much of this you know about, but um, in 2000, we started a business called netteller.com, which was uh, a home run. Uh, we, it was uh, like PayPal for online gaming. And uh, we uh, went public on the London Stock Exchange and we received, received uh, you know, achieved a market cap of around $2 billion. And I owned about 27% of that. And um, then uh, about four years later, Uncle Sam put up his hand and he arrested us all. <laughs> and I wound up uh, out, out on bail for about five years and ultimately uh, pled guilty to an offense and uh, served 45 days in prison. And I forfeited $40 million. 
my poor my uh, my partner forfeited 60 million and my company forfeited um 140 million so that between us we forfeited a, a quarter of a billion dollars to uh to uncle sam in around uh, 2010 or so that was that experience of wealth gave me um uh led me to some wonderful uh realizations um uh i th these rich guys don't fool me <laughs> i've been, i've been one of them and to you know by most people's standards i still am one <laughs> but you know i'm not not nearly like i was um my friends didn't think i was very good with money they uh they uh, uh and indeed um it, it became the title of a book called good with money that's a, a story of me but that it's uh Good with Money, A Rich Guy's Guide to Gaining Everything by Losing It All. And uh, that's essentially what my work is now, is uh, encouraging people to look to the future, encouraging, encouraging wealth to be generous, and encouraging us to be generous in all the different ways. Christian, one of the most generous things that we can do is give people our attention. One of the things, it's, it's the most generous gift we can receive. And uh, it's something that you're giving to me now. And it's something that um, uh, I want to encourage other people to give to others all the time, because the future is a very, very beautiful and rich, rich, wealthy place in my mind. And I like to encourage people that. There are enough people around who tell us that um, the, the future is trouble. And um, the, the, um, you know, we, we, don't, we don't need many more of those uh, um, campaigners. My campaign is to let people understand that the future is going to be a very, very generous and beautiful thing for, for our species for a long, long time. Wonderful, wonderful. And, and and before we get into the heavy stuff, I must I must just give an ode to you. The fact that you were able to experience some of the greatest musicians in the history of of, of music. You were able to experience people like Leon Russell, people like you know Eric Clapton, people like Rod Stewart, people who you know I I anachronistically grew up with them, listening to their music, you know, having discovered them through the digital age, you know, and so the fact that you were able to experience that, you know, in that moment, you know, in the flesh, is a it's priceless in my opinion. So what was that we, like? We get. You? We'd get up Saturday morning and we'd go line up at the store downtown to buy because we because uh, the new Kinks forty five was coming out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we'd be in line to buy this stuff and take it home and just ate it up. You know, they were they were my mentors. You know, they were my teachers. They were my um, they were my uh, you know they were they were my brothers and sisters. You know, they taught yeah. me how to they they taught me different ways to look at uh, the world for one thing, yeah. but also our consciousness, which is. Yeah. Um, you know, in my in my book, it starts out by saying, you know, people think my story is pretty crazy because I got so wealthy. But the, the truth is, uh, Christian, that um, the most astonishing thing that uh, has befallen me fell into my lap no more than it has into everybody's. And that mm -hmm. is this miracle of the conscious mm -hmm. that we, you know, disregard. We distract it all day long with all kinds of things, including phones. Mm. But if we can mm. just sit still quietly and really what it is, is it's a experiencing, you know, that place we, where our dreams come from in the night, it doesn't go to sleep in the daytime. It's still alive. Mm. We just kind of distract it with other things like, you know, money and, you know, achievement and all of those things. But if we can sit quietly just for a moment and let that place be and see what comes up, um, there is a wealth there that no amount of money could it could make better no amount of power could make more profound and we all have mm. it and uh, and it is a wealth and because it's a wealth it must be shared <laughs> so there's this sort of in, in your paradigm this sort of wealth of consciousness that we can all tap into if we just loose ourselves of the constraints of the external world and just focus and center on ourselves is that right yeah, I think just um, set them aside for a while. I, one of the ways I like to think of it, Christian, is um, thoughts um, are uh, at, at certain times in my day, uninvited guests. Mm. They're clients that don't have an appointment. Mm. 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 What I, I don't care what, you know, drifts into my mind mm. um, uh, and distracts me from my, the moment, the moment. Mm. 
-hmm. What I care about is the things that come to me in the moment when I'm available mm. for the things that bubble up within me. The most brilliant thoughts I've ever had, Christian, are ones that happened when I was chopping wood or sitting with my feet in the water. Mm. Mm -hmm. And if we're, I think it's possible, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm working on this theory. It's possible that genius is nothing more than being available for those brilliant thoughts that come to us that ordinarily we're too distracted to grab a hold of. And if we just kind of grab a hold of them and scribble down and let them go and then carry on to the next one, maybe that's the only difference between a genius and ordinary person is that they actually respect the things that come up within them and, and um, nurture them. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I, 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 I suppose my only caution would be that I recognize that I am, but I am an objective. I am a fact of what I would deem to be an objective world that has many facts in it. Um, the fact of gravity, the fact, the fact of the sun, the fact of all these facts that I, that I am coexisting with in this space and that my thoughts solely, you know, not everything that I think, has, is genius or divine. Some things that I think may very well need to go to the wayside. I mean, and you know, um, cause like Emerson very much thought that since it comes from your own mind, it comes from you, it's divine. It's some sort of genius. And you know, I love Emerson, but I think that he was solely misguided in that proposition. I don't, I think that I am but limited by the concepts that I have access to. So the more I have access to in the external world, the more I can do with my mind, the more I can do, the more fruitful thoughts arise in my being rather than me, you know, simply just sitting there in isolation and letting them come to me. You see what I'm saying? Well, I do. And I think that um, I, I, and I, it, language is a very difficult thing, but when I speak of thoughts in, in a, well, you know, my, my con or my, my uh, haiku about it is do not do no thing with thoughts. They know what they may do and mm -hmm. can F off any time. Mm -hmm. So, in that respect, I think of those thoughts as being distractions. Mm -hmm. But the, the awarenesses, the um, satori's that arise within us when we're available for them, are different than thoughts. We might call them thoughts, but that sells them short. They are um, examples of consciousness, mm -hmm. and, and those are divine. Interesting. So. Interesting. Do do you find our I'm, I'm sometimes I'm sometimes yeah. kind of prejudiced against thoughts, but most of the time I, I'm patient with them because they get me places I want to go. Like I want to get the rent paid. You yeah, know, yeah, I, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I understand. Well, would, would you consider would you consider so consciousness is something that arises within us? Do you think that it's a sort of active component of our lives or is it like something it's, that happens in a particular moment? The thing that happens in a particular moment is our becoming aware of it. Consciousness is our very being. Right. Interesting. Okay. Right. Sometimes we use it on less important things. Mm -hmm. Right. Ninety-five percent of it use it for less important things. Ninety ninety-seven percent of the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. But consciousness doesn't arise within us. Only our awareness of it does. Oh, I see. Conscious this. Consciousness is not a party that starts later. This doesn't come to us after 20 years in the Zendo. Mm -hmm. If we're smart, it comes mm -hmm. to us at every stop sign. Mm -hmm. And Christian, at, mm -hmm. at every go sign. Mm -hmm. Every instant, every moment. Yes. You see, when we, when we, when we grasp these thoughts and hold on to them, um, two things happen. One is that we're distracted from any new experiences of consciousness that arise within us mm -hmm. and the other is we stop being in the moment right and the magical thing is is that if if we know how to skate that line skate we, that's something we do up here in canada do you guys skate in georgia i guess not. no we don't have much snow <laughs> <laughs> we don't have much snow no no i come from a town we got a hockey team from you guys oh Calgary really? got wow. the atlanta flames oh wow right? really yes that's right that's yeah right. My 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 hometown Calgary owns the Flames, and and you guys sent them up to us. If we skate that line carefully, all of those things that we call thoughts, and we want to grab them and hold them and keep them and like you know make them our own, they they, they come back all the time. The most important thing is for us to just be available for all of the things around us and um, 
and uh, and that come up from within us and from outside of us. And and to, we but we need to triage them. Do you, do you do you know what triage is? That's when you go into the um, the hospital and the nurse there decides if you're uh, a, yes. a a emergency, b emergency, exactly. or no more exactly. emergency at all. Yeah. And we should triage these thoughts the same as we do our clients at the door. You know, have you got an appointment? No. Well, what do you need? Uh, no, sorry, not 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 now, not now. Thanks, I'm busy. What are you doing? Well, nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. <laughs> Interesting. Well, no, I, I I do think that there's something to be said about you know categorizing certain thoughts to make sure that they serve the certain purpose that they should serve at any sure. point in time. Um, I just I suppose I'm just struggling with the idea that every thought that makes its way to me needs to be considered. I, I don't, I think that sometimes it's good to ignore them. I think that it sometimes it's to your betterment to ignore them. Well, that's my whole point is to ignore them. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, ignore them unless they're the next uh, theme in your symphony. If mm -hmm. they're the next theme in your symphony, then write them down, then mm -hmm. ignore them. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Right. So I'm not, so unless, unless I'm they not, serve you, know. unless they serve you. Right. Well, yeah, well, and and it's what what it really is. I, I heard this phrase last week. Let me see if I can recollect it. It's um, um, proper management of attention, right? right. Proper man of management of our own attention, right? Mm -hmm. Right. We give we we should we we should lend our attention to the most important things. And mm -hmm. you know, one of the things we learned in law school is that there's um, uh, you know, there's uh, a difference between urgent and important. And some mm -hmm. things are urgent, but not very important. Right. And other things are really, really important, but not particularly urgent. Right. And, you know, but, and if we practice proper, proper uh, attention management, a beautiful thing happens. We start to realize that just, you know, the, well, we, we call it smelling the roses, but just being, we feel this thing and this thing that we feel is, you know, I mean, this is going to sound corny Christian, but it's life. And it's mm -hmm. miraculous. Mm -hmm. And it's like all on right now. It doesn't start later. It doesn't start after I get the, the you know, the new, uh, the new BMW, or it doesn't start after I get the new like washing machine or the, the condo at Aspen, you know, it, it, this, this party has, it has, it's already half over <laughs> and it's mm -hmm. time to wake up to it because it's on right now. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the way I look at it. So awareness, basically awareness. Awakeness. Yes. yes. Awakeness. Interesting. There are lots of words. Being yeah. present and being present. Yeah. You know, Interesting. it's being, right. being, being here in the moment. No, not that moment. This one. No, not, no, not then. Now. No, now. No, no, now. <laughs> is time a linear function for you? It's or a linear it's... illusion. Yeah. Time's an illusion. <laughs> and what, in what sense? I think so. Well, we, 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 we tend to experience our life in, in a linear way. And we take it for granted that that's um, sort of fundamental to the universe. And that's what it is. But, um, you know, okay, think of, think, think of that moment that we call the, the moment, the present. Mm -hmm. Think right. of the present, right? Mm -hmm. it's, um, it, it, theoretically, there's an equal amount of past behind it as there is future in front of it, right? But it's that razor thin thinner than razor's edge of this pr pr the instant that and time is going by it but the moment is eternal it never goes away the moment is like always there's always going to be this moment no not that one this one this, the, the present moment so so in a way the present is eternal the only thing that's not eternal is the past and the future so in that sense, um, time is sort of illusory. <laughs> well, but so I, I would categorize the present. Let, let's say that the past is, is a road, okay? And the future is the part of the road you cannot not yet, not yet see. The present is the vehicle that you're traveling on in the road to constantly get to the future. And as you get closer to the future, it fades away. As you get, as you get farther from the present, it all, the past, it also fades away. Um, and I, I guess in that sense, there are always different kinds of presence, right? Not, not like 
presence gets like presence as in there's different mm -hmm. kinds of instances of presence um but that itself is still fleeting because it's simply a qualifier that i use to identify any given moment on the journey on the road so i i i maybe maybe how we maybe the word we use is like consistent and constant but i think that the moments that the, the present uses to i the moments that the present the word the present uses to identify are of course fleeting i i think that these words are ultimately just identifiers for in my opinion objective phenomenon um so that's that's how i approach the issue of time yeah yeah they're fleeting those uh, what what used to be the present is fleeting but one thing that's that never fleets is the present Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it keeps coming again and again and again and it's absolutely implacable it cannot be stopped it uh -huh. keeps coming interesting well um let's move on to the book uh, I, I, like i find it very interesting this metaphysical conversation i do um but i i i really want to discuss the book because i think that it's that it's yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah i'm really yeah. um i'm really grateful that you've Found that you found some interest in it, Christian, because absolutely. I think it's, um, yes, it's something that is very dear to me, obviously. Yes, sir, absolutely. So the book is called Oswell, Where Thou Art, Earth and Why. And, you know, why don't you, I don't want to describe your book for you. I don't want to put my in, the imprint of my consciousness on your book. So what does, what is your book trying to do for you? And, and what does it mean to you? Um, to explain to myself and anybody else who's interested um what it means to be a human being on earth uh our place in the universe our place in infinity which is um distance right our place in eternity which is time and our promise i suppose what what it what it is what we know what we don't know and what we might be if we handle ourselves carefully it going going forward so it's it's about um rather than the story of me everybody thought it would be a good idea for me to write my story of the story of me mm -hmm. and i think you this will sound familiar to you from the beginning of my book but i very I, I i became bored very quickly by uh writing sentences that start with i and end with me and I decided mm -hmm. yes, I wanted, if I'm only going to write one book in my life, I'd rather write a book that was about something important. <laughs> oh, really? And, and, that, and that was, you know, that what is important to me is trying to put my finger on what it means to be a human being. What we come up with in, in, in the, you know, in that, um, in that uh, exploration uh, is that we're uh, in, in some ways a little bit grown up, but in most ways quite infantile, particularly in the sense of knowledge. Uh, you know, we may have 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 or 40,000 years worth of knowledge, but all of the time that we gathered that knowledge, um, it was pretty much unattestable. Uh, and it was only since the Enlightenment, about 200 years ago, that we began to discern what, what you know, know actually means and, you know, what we can know and what we can't, can't what, what we can't say we know, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the Karl Popper things and that, you know, but the, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and most of the knowledge that we use to do all of the things that we've achieved in our contemporary society is quite new knowledge. It's in the last hundred years or maybe 200 years. If you think of, or maybe 300 years, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. uh, before, before that, you know, we used to think that, um, you know, the seasons were the moods of the gods and, you mm -hmm. know, um, and that, and, and that sort of thing. And it was, we, and, you know what we and we, we we devoted ourselves to learning those myths and the people who learned them the most got the most put, uh, got got the most wives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the smarter we learned those incorrectnesses, the more we survived in our society, mm -hmm. right? The higher we rose in our society, mm -hmm. you know. So if we were if we understood the god Jupiter better than the next guy, then then we got the more beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But in the last 200 years or so, things have changed. And we've started to understand that um, there's some things that we can't say we know. And, and it's, it's really, really and, and it's that, that fallibility of our knowledge that has brought us to the most steep learning curve in our history. When we think about it, 
you know, all of those things that have, we've learned in my lifetime, like I was born in 1951, you know, um, uh, and, you know, when, when I was born, generally speaking, people didn't know the difference between um, a planet and a star, generally speaking, some people did. For sure, most people didn't know the difference between a star and a galaxy. Here we are 50 years later, and we know that there are you know, 250 billion stars in our galaxy. And there's probably more galaxies in the universe than there are stars in our galaxy. And, you know, that we need, we, we see light with our radio telescopes that's 16 billion years old. Mm -hmm. And we, and we know that because, uh, and, and we know that when we look at that, that, that it's light that's uh, from 16 billion years ago, maybe light from, you know, the big bang or something like that. So this, Christian, we've learned in my lifetime. I'm going to be 70 this summer. Wow. Imagine, Christian, for me, what we're going to learn in the next 70 years. And like I say in my book, right. what we learn in the next 70 years is going to make what we know now look like rocks in pockets. Right. It's going to, it's going to make it's going to make our computers look like abacuses. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then the 70 years after that, Christian, and then the 70 years after that, and I'm not going to keep up with this, but I am going to tell you this, all of those 70 years is worth of knowledge. So astonishing from the difference from there was no difference between a star and a galaxy to where we are now. Mm -hmm. All of those 70 years, Christian, is all of the things that we don't know now. Mm -hmm. If you take the history of human knowledge and, 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 and chop it at any given point in a cross section, you're going to see a bunch of people who thought they had just about everything figured out by now. Well, now we know that's not true. Right. We know in my lifetime what we've learned in my lifetime. And compare that to what you're going to learn in your lifetime, Christian. I don't know how old you are, but you're sure as hell not 70. I'm 20. <laughs> I'm 20. I, I remember 20 the, um, <laughs> and, and Christian, the things that we'll learn in your grandchild's lifetime, if we were smart, we would be a little bit humble, but I'm afraid we're neither. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and I think this explains why you um, use the term misconception rather than theory in yes. your book. You, you like that term because you, because it, it, for you, it admits that there is a vast unknown that we have not tapped yet into. And so what we know right now is not sufficient because it is not taken into account all that we could possibly know. So you call it a misconception on the basis that it could possibly change upon future knowledge, correct? Very likely will change, right? Yeah. Most, of, most of our theories do evolve. And yeah, I, exactly. Know, and it's, it's, just a, it's just a smart aleck thing, really, Christian. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't, you know, that's, the, the word theory actually comprehends that, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yes, yes, it does. Yeah, that's what I was right. going to say. Yeah. <laughs> so, and so I want, I want you to know I'm alert to that. But it's okay. just a funny thing that, you know, we, why, why would we call it the theory of relativity when we, we why, why, why wouldn't we just call it the misconception of relativity, re relativity and get on with finding out where, what, what doesn't work about it? <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I you know, the I think the scientific method that lends itself to that kind of uh, a kind of procedure. It looks at particular it, things, exactly. it tests, and it sees. And mm -hmm. I think right now a lot of the theories we have about the universe are within the reach within the reach of our current resources of knowledge. They are the best theories that we have, and so we just go with them. It, absolutely, absolutely, they are. But and the only thing that you know, and I and I I play around with this in my book. My book is a little bit gonzo. I think you'll appreciate <laughs> that, right? But yeah. but you know the, the the main point of that kind of um, um, you know uh, uh, inquiry really in my book is uh, to uh, encourage people to understand um, not only how much we know but how little we know. Exactly. And you know generally generally speaking. Uh, the, our explanations for things aren't yet quite as good as they probably will be eventually. <laughs> right. Um, the, 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 right. The point. So, the, yeah. Sorry. I was just going to say. So encouraging people to look forward to like, achieving those newer explanations. The sooner, the better. That's Absolutely. what the book is about. Absolutely. Now you do seem, and please correct me if I'm mis misconceiving this, but you do seem to say 
that humanity is held back from the knowledge, the universal knowledge that they could have because of some of the things that humanity aids and abets. You mentioned corporate greed, you mentioned sweatshops, you mentioned a lot of stuff in the book. Um, so do you think that the only way we can, we will, or the primary way for us to obtain sort of higher and fuller knowledge is by us to conduct ourselves in a particular way? In a particular way, did you say? Yeah. Yes, yes. The particular that you prescribe in yeah. your book. Yeah, I, the, yeah, and the, um, yes, I do. And that particular way is uh, respectful of all other, of all other, of all other people, respectful of all other people. Now, you know, yeah. um, we, we um, for, to me, the, the fundamental theory is that, um, you know, freedom comes at a cost uh, and it's a cost that most of us don't pay. When we were children, um, when, when, when we were children, we were taught that uh, the, the cost of freedom was giving one's life to, to in, you know, for instance, in wars to, to preserve freedom. And um, I, it occurred to me, Christian, that actually that's not a very high price because only one in a million of us pay it. All the rest of us get it for free. Mm -hmm. I think actually um, the cost of freedom is much higher than that, unfortunately. The cost of freedom, I think, is more like what they taught us when we were kids. And that was every day of freedom that you enjoy, we must strive to make sure that others who are less fortunate have a chance to get that freedom in their life as well. Right. So free, freedom, freedom is something that we have to share. And if we try our hardest to share it, then we've earned it. If we don't, we haven't. And so I say in my book, yeah. those who accept the benefits of freedom, but not its responsibilities, haven't earned their freedom. Mm -hmm. Those who accept the benefits of freedom but are careless of what others less fortunate must endure have not earned their freedom but have only taken liberties mm -hmm. the way we must live is by striving every day to understand that everybody on this planet is entitled to all of the things that you and i take for granted all of the basics I'm not saying everybody gets a Cadillac or a Corvette. That was a mistake we made when we were kids. We used to think everybody gets a Corvette. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about respect of the person, security of the person, food, clothing, and shelter, or at least access to those things. Right. And access to the tools of self-improvement, education, the tools of health, health care, the tools of justice, and finally, the basic elements of capital, basic capital. That Oh, actually, that's not finally. Finally is... Everybody is entitled to access to a clean environment, to a healthy environment. And we should be providing those to everybody on, on the planet. Indeed, you know what, Christian, we will be. And the reason we will be is because when we do, we'll all be richer. This, this idea that taking wealth and hoarding it to oneself, Christian, is the wet dream of wealth. Mm -hmm. It comes for no particular purpose. We hang on to it and... The only, the only way it can serve us more is if we get more. And, but the true nature of the goodness of wealth is when we share it. And when we share it, something really wonderful happens. Two things, one happens. We develop the productivity of the people that we share it with, and they, and they, they generate their own wealth. They look after themselves. The other thing is, people you help, don't bust your balls. So, so yeah, we're, yeah. So the responsibilities of freedom look like they cost money, but they don't. They make money because they make everybody more more capable of looking after themselves. One of the things I I, I play with now, I toy this, you know, the concept upon which the United States was created, <clears throat> and I, as you know in my book, I quote Adam Smith frequently. Yes, you do. Well, our Adam, Adam Smith's idea of humanity is a super positive concept of humanity right. what he thought was you know he, he thought he called you know quaintly he calls people men you know I, we've gotten beyond that a little bit now we call people people but i think when he said men he meant people but he thought that men were good right and when you turn good men free 
right? When you turn good people free to do whatever they wish, they're going to do what's best for everybody. That's a super positive view of human nature. And I endorse it absolutely. But what do we think now, Christian? Now we think if we give a guy 400 bucks in COVID, we're going to turn him into a bum. Hmm. That's not a positive view of human nature. So I want us to look at that. And I want us to return to what really will make America great again. And that is that view of human nature that people are fundamentally good. And if we give them the tools, the basic tools, they won't become bums. They'll look after themselves. I want to tell you this on that note. Yes, when we start to give things to people, education, health care, daycare, elder care, when we start to, some people are going to beat us for it, Christian. Some people are going to beat us for it. I don't know what the number is. Might be 20%, might be 10%, might be 30%, which is be, you know, people who screw the dog and sit down and do nothing. But let, but you know what? If we have a responsibility to share freedom with everybody, that responsibility is not absolved because 10% of the people are going to beat us for it. We still have the responsibility to look after the other 90% or 80% or 70% or whatever it is, whatever it is. So, so So I'm, I really despise this really pessimistic view of human nature that comes with, well, I'm going to say it right out loud now, libertarians who don't want to pay taxes. (laughs) <laughs> it's an honor to pay taxes in this country. Oh. <laughs> and, what, and it's also a duty for us, Christian, it's a duty to make sure those taxes are, spelt, are spent on the universal rights of everybody else. Mm. Mm. Well, um, that's our duty as free people. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a lot to unpack there. Um, you bet it is. <laughs> so, so <laughs> it's yeah, pretty no, simple, I, though. Yes, when you uh, when you understand all of it, it becomes very simple, I think. But, you know, I think all frameworks require a little bit of um, traveling around to get their intricacies. Yeah. Um, Yeah, let's do that. So my primary problem with your framework. Well, the human nature thing is a different thing that we can discuss that if we have time a little bit later. Um, That's that's an entirely different thing thing to uh, uh, an egg to scramble. But I, I, I don't think, I think that your framework ties freedom into things that you get, which suggests that freedom is given to someone. I genuinely believe, as did many of the American founders, as did John Locke, as did natural law theorists that predate John Locke, I genuinely believe that freedom is a natural consequence of our being. It is a a, a sort of ubiquitous reality that allows us to operate and move and is informed by natural rights, which also enable us in a social context to live responsibly and live morally. That's what I believe. I do not believe that anyone gives me my freedom. I do not believe that a product such as healthcare or elder care makes me more or less free. Because if that, if that is the case, then my freedom is contingent upon the approbation of others. And in that instance, it does not become freedom. It becomes some sort of serfdom, some sort of quasi serfdom. Now, this is the difference do, between- Do you believe that you can have your freedom taken from you? I believe that my freedom can be assailed, but I, I do not believe that as long as I am alive, my freedom can be taken from me. They can, it can be inhibited, it can be assailed, it can be attacked. But I do not believe as long as I am a breathing individual in this world that my freedom is ever truly gone because- That's a very privileged, that's a very, very privileged point of view. That's an extremely privileged point of view. And I'm going to just tell, let me ask you this. If you were a a skin covered skeleton of a woman on the the sands of Somalia Hmm. with a dying baby at your breast with snot on his nose and flies in his eyes. And the only thing that little baby could get out of your breast was a dying whimper because there was nothing there to generate. Do you think, do you, do, you, do you think that lady is free? She still has. Freedom is a natural look. The lady is obviously in a state of destitution. She's not, she is not in a state that I would consider acceptable for anyone. 
That's that that's a fact. But I do most certainly believe that she still has natural freedom within herself, and she still has the ability to act, the capacity to act. You know, I, I define freedom as something much more than simply you know having access to things. I, I, yes. Yeah, so the lady is obviously in a state of destitution, and if we were to tie her freedom to what she has, then I guess she would be unfree. But the best thing is, even the people who are the most in the most impoverished, in the most you know worse environments among us, even they still have the fundamental value and the fundamental agency that natural freedom gives them. So yes, I do believe that she is free, although she is in a terrible, terrible state. Um, you know, that, that it is precipitated by many different factors, I would assume, if it's in Somalia. I mean, that's a war-torn country that has no respect for natural freedom, that has no respect for individual rights. Um, so, you know, uh, she is, in that instance, probably a victim of that sort of indifference towards freedom. So, yes, I do, I do believe she's free. I do. It's a freedom that would not be valued very highly by her, I'm afraid. And that's unfortunate. And it, I think that, you know, and, and, you know, Jefferson said this in the declaration. No, and, and, yeah. And let me ask you, Christian, I don't want to interrupt you, Christian, but I need to ask you this. How high would, how highly would you value that freedom? If the freedom if, of the lady on the desert in Somalia. So again, I don't link, I would not, I don't link my freedom to material circumstances. Now, of course, that does not mean that everyone should. Your freedom your freedom comes to you because of your affluence. I I I, I don't agree. I, I don't I don't I don't think so. I think that because if I'm to believe that, then I'm to believe that you know I I I just if I'm to believe that affluence is the marker of freedom, then I'm to believe that freedom again is a thing that is inherently tied to material quantities and can be taken or given as freely as the person who provides you. Um, with the material quantities wants to. And that's not freedom, in my opinion. That is something, a serfdom. So no, I, I don't, I think that my ability to acknowledge and enjoy my freedom certainly is influenced by the lack of externalities in my environment. It certainly is influenced by, yes, I agree with that. But the fact of my freedom, whether I'm impoverished in um, an urban community, or whether I'm in the suburbs, or whether I'm a poor college student like I am right now, the reality of my freedom is still constant in my being. It's a sort of ontological thing for me. Okay. <laughs> that being said, I think we owe the lady in the desert in Somalia a, a, a hand. I so wouldn't mind helping what, her. What? Yeah. Well, we. I, I hope you don't mind because I think it's your duty. It's your duty as a free person. It's your duty as a free person in my book to strive daily to assure that everybody else enjoys their freedom the same way you enjoy your freedom or at least on a similar level. Now, the lady in Somalia, you know, she probably is not, you know, well, I don't wanna make assumptions. This is an abstraction, of course. And so we can make abstractions, whatever we want them to be. But I, 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 I think that freedom requires, you know, even though it is a natural condition of your being, I think that freedom requires reason, a mindset to tap into. And some people's mindsets are not, even when they get the material bounties, are not going to be fixed towards, okay, I am a free individual, because they may still be influenced by their conditions. I think freedom is all about being able to say, notwithstanding my condition, notwithstanding my trials, notwithstanding my plight, I am still a beautifully free individual. This was actually the story of the American, uh, uh, of the American, um, African American slaves, uh, who you know, before they were free physically, had to be free in, in their mentalities. And that's why they sung spirituals. So uh, I, I, I think that it's very contingent um, on how we perceive things, really. Our interaction with freedom is contingent on how we perceive things. 
And maybe there's I think a case- that's philosophically interesting. I think it's very, I think it's very interesting philosophically, but I'm going to switch the conversation when we may, like we can talk about your, this kind of freedom more if you like, and I'm happy sure. to do that. Sure. But my book is about then not freedom. It's about universal rights. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And the rights that we are, that you and I take for granted in our, like it or not, affluent society uh, are, I think, ought to be available to everybody. Not in terms of the affluence, but basic affluence, absolutely. Basic affluence. Everybody should be able to get on a computer and learn uh, John Locke. Well, I would, I would like everyone to have that opportunity, but it's all about means. You know, how, how, do we, how do we ensure that to happen if we begin saying that, you know, people who have access to computers or computer manufacturers or whatever should, you know, automatically make their services free of charge people on their material conditions. I mean, you are, you, you get into a position where you would probably, the people who make the computers, the people who provide the computers, all of them have to work too. All of them have to feed themselves too. So you get into a position where- it's, it's, it's not their responsibility any more than it's all of ours responsibility. All free people have this responsibility. All people who have universal rights, the things that we, the things that I consider to be on universal rights, all of people who already have those rights have this duty together. It's not the duty of people who make computers to provide computers. It's the duty of people who have rights to extend those rights to all others. And, and you, and again, it's you, a commu right, right. it's a cumulative, it's a cumulative responsibility. And you, and again, you classify rights as having access to material bounty, essentially, right? Uh, fundamental material availability, fundamental, fundamental, uh, the basics, yeah, basic now, needs. It, now basic needs yes yes same as now, you do actually <laughs> right well well uh, I, now i do want to mention that in america if you are impoverished you are in the top one percent of the global poverty i mean you have typically you have access to some sort of medical care you typically have a tv you typically have oh, an xbox you typically, exactly. you, if, exactly. you're, if you're in america you are in your impoverished you are living pretty good um so i yeah uh, now, that does not mean that you're living as best as you possibly could be in other income brackets. But, you know, I think that I think that if you have the very, you know, I, I just I'm struggling with this idea that it is a right to have certain services. You know, I think that's our fundamental. To have what? I'm, I'm struggling with this idea that it is a right to have certain services. That's our fundamental disagreement here. It, that it is a right to have a right to have certain services. Well, um, <laughs> because let's. That, uh, I think you and I, you and I, are going to have to agree to dis disagree. I think everybody has a right to education. I think everybody has a right to health care. I think everybody has a right to justice. That's what democracy means. I think I think all three of those things are are somewhat vastly different even if they exist in the same social context, they should probably be understood as different in principle, right? So theoretically- In what way? Well, theoretically, if I, so theoretically, education does not necessarily need to come from an institution. It oftentimes does, because that's the way our society is set up with the oppression system and everything, but it doesn't have to. I mean, if you, if, and there are impoverished families who have had access to books or magazines, they give those books or magazines to their kids, they give their kids the mentality to train them to become something bigger and better than they were in their lifetime, that's education. I, I don't think that is something as, you know, it, it's something that is incredibly relative and not as quantifiable as say healthcare might be. Because healthcare, unlike education, does indeed require a, a certain level of expertise, a certain level of process to ensure the correct things are being done because the human body is such a very unique, uh, thing. Whereas education, I mean, if you have access to some kind of learning materials, even if it's like a pamphlet, even if it's a letter, you can begin education. I think that education really begins with the self rather than being this sort of grand social idea. Um, I think, you know, healthcare is a, it's a different case. 
Um, you know, but you know, you mentioned course, health just, you mentioned justice. Ju justice. Justice is a different case too. You're right. It, yes. it, it, they take different kinds of application of our energy for right. sure. Right. And, and you know, you know it, I, I guess, and again, I don't want to, we don't have to get too deep into this, but I guess we'd also define justice deeper differently. I'm, I'm assuming we do. I, I, I think you would define it as making sure the needy have what they need to sustain themselves in society. No, I mean justice. I mean the ability to fight off injustice. Well, what, is, what does that mean? I mean I, I mean, if somebody perpetrates an injustice upon you, Christian, you have somebody you can turn to to right, right that injustice. So that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking would, about justice. I'm talking about if somebody steals. I'm talking about if somebody steals your shit. Mm -hmm. Somebody's going to take your call and help you get your shit back. Right. Right. That's what I'm talking about. Now, justice. So justice is. The process of ensuring that my property is protected because i just want to get like one a, of the things one, okay that's one of the things okay i just want to get like a working definition here um well what property is not necessarily the most important thing well i, I think i think that also it. also that you'll be treated fairly in the marketplace i i'm surprised i have to talk to you about this stuff christian well, there's lots about justice that has nothing to do with property. Well, no, is, no. Is this oh, news to you? No, 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 of course not. No, 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 of course not. I think that I think that justice is actually much bigger than simply material property. I agree with you, but there are a lot Absol of absolutely there are a lot of different competing theories of justice, John. John Rawls has a has a theory of justice that is different from Robert Nozick. There's a lot of philosophers that talk about justice all the time. Played up with kind justice is about the self, balancing the self and making sure that you're not being an excess. Aristotelian justice is kind of like a similar thing. So I mean, everyone has different ideas of justice, and I simply want to explore what your ideas of justice are in your paradigm. Okay. Well, in 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 my paradigm, I think American constitutional democracy has settled upon certain basics of justice. And I agree with you. American constitutional democracy must accord those, those those parameters of justice as widely as it possibly can. Now, remember from my book, you understand accord doesn't mean just say you've got them. They have to actually make your experience accord with your rights, right? So delivering justice, right? And I don't say, yeah, sure, there's different philosophical views about jurisprudence or about law and about natural law or utilitarian law. And I, yeah, no, no. America has decided that there are certain basic elements of justice. Right. And it's not available to people who don't have $400 an hour to pay a fancy lawyer like me. That's what uh, I'm talking about. Well, I, I that's what I, I'm talking about. Access to justice. That's what I, I'm I do, talking about. I, I, I do agree that the court system is fundamentally flawed and should be um, reformed. And I'm sure as a practicing, a, a former practicing attorney, you would also agree. I, I wouldn't, I entirely agree with that. Um, I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to conceptualize because even the ideas of American justice are by some considered to be fundamentally unjust. I mean, there is a contention of social justice scholars who think that the idea of American justice is you know, was meant for a particular kind of people, a particular kind of class, and that's who it serves. And so I wanted to see. Well, that's not what. That's not what. That's not what your constitutional structure says. That's just the way it's been applied. Says, but your constitutional right. structure says all men are right. created equal. That's right. I don't that's think right. they mean men. I think right. they mean people. Right. I agree. All people. Right. Right. That's right. fundamentally right. Indeed, oh, I, agree. I think the basis of American constitutional democracy is the best basis for human rights anywhere. Oh, I, 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 I you I guys agree. are falling short a little bit on the application side, Christian. I, 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 I do think America has troubles and issues. I do agree with that. But I think that, you know, as you said, I think that we are fundamentally we have the best framework by which to approach justice and the most, I would say, most morally righteous framework by which to approach justice than any other country on this earth ever had. Or ever will have in my opinion. Right. No. Yeah. The the black people were ignored from out of the gate. 
So are the First Nations people. So are the women. Right? But well, yeah, yes. The constitutional basis is right. It's just not been a, it as it, it awaits being applied correctly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Right. Right? Right. So I'm not confused about that. Right. No, I, I, I would never presume that you're confused at all, sir. I, I'm just I'm just trying to explore, you know, one of the things that we are taught in our in, in our in our philosophy classes is that every single thing, every precept, every every supposed axiom must be questioned, it must be dissected if you're going to have if you're going to walk in epistemic humility. You mentioned being sure. humble with knowledge, and so I'm just trying to do that. I'm not trying to sure. offend or anything. We obviously have very fundamental disagreements, but I that's part of the reason why I have these conversations. I don't even buy that yet. <laughs> I, I I think we conceptual I think we conceptualize rights very differently. I think that rights are a product of natural freedom and natural freedom cannot be taken or given to you by your material circumstances. And you believe that rights are inherently involved with material circumstances and making sure that everyone has basic needs. What I believe is that we, we have the rights by birthright, but they can be taken from us by pricks. And, 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 and one of the pricks that you outline in your book are people who have this sort of excessive notion of private property. Yeah, Charles Koch dumped over 90 million pounds of mercury into water in America, primarily in Love Canal. He's a libertarian. When they brought that libertarian uh -huh. to court and, and made him stand on the carpet for dumping 90 million pounds of mercury into Love Canal, you know what he said? Christian? I don't know what he said, no. I thought we lived in a free country. Mm -hmm. And I thought we lived in a free country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. <laughs> that is not what freedom is. Because that kind of freedom does not respect everybody else's right to drink water that doesn't have mercury in it. Right. Well, we I don't need any more of that kind of freedom. I don't, I don't know the particulars of the Charles Koch situation, so I'm not going to. Well, to I just told you them. Well, I, I just I, told you them. I want to make sure that I could, you know, research and, and do a little bit more digging about it. Please um, do. I suggest you read. I, I, I suggest you read Jane Meyer's book. She works at the New York, uh, at the New York Times. Dark Money. Jane Meyer, M A Y E R. Her book is called Dark Money. Dark Money. Yeah. And she'll yeah. tell you all about it. Oh well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with theories about money and politics. I. I uh, you know, I No, this I, is I, different. This is different. That's not that. You're not familiar with Jane Meyer's book, or else you wouldn't question me on Charles Koch. Well, no, I think that every proposition needs to be questioned. Charles Koch is a very controversial figure. I think that, you know, sometimes he's given uh, a, a certain shake by different people, whether they're on the left or the right. So I just want to make sure that I'm getting all the facts right. But what I do know is that if, if you know, if property rights were as ubiquitous as they should be, I think it would be much harder for corporations to do that kind of stuff. To dump mercury? Yes, if, if, if everyone owned land, you would have the legal protections there to make sure that if someone tried to dump whatever into whatever body of land that you owned, you could fight it in court and you could punish them. And this is what is called a free market environmentalism. I think that if we had property rights ubiquitous as they should be, we'd be able to, to fight this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but you know what? That property is owned by people. That property is owned by America. It's I, the commons. It's the commons. Well, well I, it's the commons. It's owned by the people. The fresh water in America is owned by the American people. And it's the American people's responsibility to make sure that nobody dumps mercury in that water. It's not some private guy's responsibility. It's America's responsibility to make sure that Charles Koch doesn't dump mercury in water. America has failed it, because it did not prevent Charles Koch from dumping that into the commons. And now America pays the price, Christian. Now America has to pay the super fund. And you guys are paying through the nose to clean up after these guys who said, well, I thought it was a free country. Well, don't, don't you think it'd be harder for a corporation to abuse the environment if 
they were going against a private actor as opposed to being against the sort of amorphous distinction of the American people, I think that it'd be much harder. No. I think it would be much harder for them to go against the American people if the American people hadn't elected people who were for sale for money. Well, America, American, American constitutional democracy has allowed the thumb of the selfish wealthy to be on the levers of power. They buy influence and they elect guys like Mitch McConnell and they, those guys, you know, forgive me, Christian, but they do not care about the water. Okay. Well, I have nothing. I have, I have, no they don't care about the water. I have no love for Mitch Pardon McConnell. Me? So. I have no love for Mitch McConnell. So yeah. I have no love for Mitch yeah. McConnell. Right. Guys like him will will say, well, what are, you know, the, the America has a responsibility to its common property, its national parks, its water, its air. America has responsibility. It's it needs to rise to that responsibility. And Giving over the air to private property. How, how do you give air to private property? What if well, the air was owned by private property? Then people could then people could sue in court for the air. Well, I, I don't look. I, I don't believe in owning air. Um, I, I I don't think that's from a property rights standpoint that's even feasible. But I I do because you know Locke mentions okay. Locke mentions mixing when when one mixes his labor with the earth. That's when they can begin to say, okay, I own this. And that requires a sort of material thing you have to grab, you have to, you have to hone, you have to habituate. So no, I don't think owning the air, I mean, I mean, I don't believe I don't own the air, owning the rain or anything like that. Although governments have tried to tax the air and the rain in the past. And I think that's kind of ridiculous, but I don't believe in owning any of that kind of stuff. Um, there's a line but, of law now that there's a line of law ever since the inception of America, actually, there's a line of law uh, called the public trust, which holds that the air and the public waterways are owned by are held held by the government in trust for the American people, but they haven't haven't quite lived up to that yet. I'm afraid that what you're taking what you're saying to me though, and here I'm just asking. I'm I'm not questioning what you're saying now to make sure I'm hearing you properly. But I'm afraid what you're saying is if somebody can't own something, then there's no mechanism to protect it. So no. if you can't own the air, then there's no. If you can't own the air, then there's no mechanism to protect. It. No, I'm not. I'm not saying that. I, I, I'm just said. No, I, I, I don't think what I said implies that necessarily. I simply said that it's kind of absurd to think that you can own the air. Now, the protection mechanism came in our conversation about the waterways. I do think people can maintain and mix their labor with the waterways. It's much, much easier than the, than the air. And I do think that if a corporation were to try to abuse a wetland or a waterway that was owned by a private individual, it would be much, much, much more difficult given our system of torts uh, than it would be if it's owned by some sort of amorphous abstraction uh, of collective ownership, which in my opinion means no ownership whatsoever. So I, I don't yeah, that's think what, that, that's that, that's what I was afraid I was hearing. But well, what you're saying is we the people, what you're saying to me is we the people is an amorphous abstraction. I, I, I think when it comes to something as tangible as ownership, yes. We the people. When it comes to ownership, and I don't. Now, they own the commons. They own, we the people own the commons. They're just irresponsible with it, Christian. They've sold it over to Charles Koch. And you guys got to get your responsibility back in hand. You own that property and you're irresponsibly letting it not be, be cared for by, because of some, well, some, I don't know what it is, some idea about, well, it's not private property, therefore it can't be protected. Some amorphous thing. You know, we the people has to stop being amorphous. We the people is a real thing. Well, you how, guys own stuff. You own the air. You own the water. I've you never, own the melting snow on top of the mountains. Uh, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think I own... I don't think... I think we have different ideas of ownership. I don't think I own... I have never been near that lake that you're talking about that he dumped all the stuff. I've never been near it. I've never looked at it. I don't even, I didn't even know it existed. I don't, how can I own what it? Difference, what difference does that make? That if you've been near it or not, he dumped in it. And, and I think that- What difference does it make if you've been near it or not? 
I think, no, I think, look, the, the, the action speaks for itself. That, that does not make any difference. What I'm saying is you can better correct the action of environmental abuse if you had a tangible stake yourself in that land, because then there are there would be more reasonable protections yeah. there. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, was, yeah, well, see, we don't disagree at all. You have a tangible state. It's no, I America. don't. I, I don't think that I don't believe in collective ownership, though. I believe in private ownership. There, how okay? How do you, do you believe in prior private ownership of the air? No, no, that's not what we're talking about, though. That's not, that's not the same thing. Yes, no, no. I want to talk about that. You believe well, in private ownership. I've already I don't challenged believe, you on this. I don't I, believe. I, I, I've said under your under your framework, there's no way to protect the air. No, I, I, I don't. I don't think that is that is true. I, I think that again, if so, obviously the air is this sort of vast thing that is ubiquitous. It would be very absurd to own it. There, there wouldn't be any way to tangibly interact with that. Um, well, then but how do you I, protect it? But I do think that if you have, let's say you have, okay, under the free market environmentalist idea, let's say you have a corporation or a whatever, a factory that is right near your farmland and there are fumes going towards your farmland, you can demonstrate that this farmland that you own privately and in, in the quality of the air is being degraded. You can then go to court and say, hey, these guys are infringing upon my property. You can do that without having a government regulation which would restrict free enterprise, in my opinion. You can do that by simply having individuals make the best decisions about the environmental safety for what they own, what they have a stake in individually. That's how you would protect the air. Now, this would assume I'm a certain level. This would assume how come certain... Detroit is still drinking? No, no, well, I think I think Detroit. How come hasn't... Detroit is still drinking lead? I think Detroit had, there's a, a lot of different issues why, going on in Detroit. Why are they still drinking lead? There are a lot there's, of different issues going on in Detroit. There's two million farmers in Detroit and they've, there's you know, four million farmers in Detroit and they've each got a little place on the corner. How come we, they can't get the lead out? We, we, don't, we, don't have, we don't have a regime of private property rights over the environment quite yet. I mean, uh, uh, land ownership is sometimes there are subsidies. I mean, a lot of farmers have subsidies. The government is involved in almost every single trench and nook and cranny of land ownership these days, unfortunately. <laughs> and and I would you asked me about, you asked me about my book, and I'm going to tell you right here and right now that my book does not nothing depends on private property ownership. I know that's They're my called problem. Universal rights. They're called universal rights. And my rights, my book has a way to protect the air and the water, and yours does not. I, I disagree. I, I just explained a possible way for you. I mean, there are many different circumstances that could arise. But no, I, I, I read your book, and I, I understand your framework. I think that it's, it's refreshing in our current political system, because look, a lot of people don't talk about things the way you do. So I want to compliment you about that. I just... Don't think Thank we you. agree on very much. <laughs> we agree on something. I still think you're wrong. We agree I on think, some I, things. I think we do actually agree. But I, and I'd like, to, I'd really like to pick this up again on some specific topics. Sure. You know what you and I should do, I think? Why don't, why don't, why don't we correspond a little bit and try to nail down some of these, like, um, uh, the way we use our words. Okay. Just select a couple of definitions. And I think, Christian, that you and I could actually really get somewhere beautiful, because I know that fundamentally, you, you agree that we have the same, we, I think we agree about the responsibilities that we have, but well, who, how they get, how they get, I think how they get kind of executed is, is kind of complex. And I think for libertarians, it's going to be because, like you say, this thing of collective ownership kind of makes you guys rankle a little bit. But I'm here to tell you that unless you guys relent on this collective ownership thing, the air is not going to be protected and neither is the water. I, I, I think we'll have to disagree on that note. Um, and yeah, we can keep corresponding and we can keep talking. I have no problem with that. I, I thoroughly, uh, John, look, I thoroughly enjoyed the spirit of conversation. Um, you know, I, I look forward to having you, having you back on. Um, do you have anything else to say to the audience before we go? You know what? America is on the cusp of actually fulfilling its promise. When it started, it had the greatest, greatest idea. It just executed it in a really, really lame way. But 
we're coming to a time now when the hand of the selfish wealthy can be taken off the levers of power and returned to one man, one vote, one person, one vote. And that's just about to happen in America again. And that's the opportunity for America to actually fulfill the promise that's set forth so beautifully in the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution. You guys have a great, great tool and you have to refine how you execute with it. All right. Well, okay. I appreciate your perspective, John. And uh, again, thank you for the spirited conversation. I, I do appreciate it. It's like you said before, or like I said to you before, um, the most valuable thing that you can pay to somebody these days is attention. And you've right. paid me a lot of it. And I really, really appreciate it a lot. Uh, well, Thanks, I, Christian. I, I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm very happy to. Uh, anytime. Very, anytime. Very best wishes on your career as a student and beyond. All right. I appreciate it, sir. Thank you. And as always, everyone, Thank please you, be sure to stay pensive. Bye-bye.